Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir à tous. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking the conference organizers for the invitation. I have to confess that I was puzzled at first when I received the in invitation for, for two reasons. One, sad to say, I knew very little about the Fondation Merir, and the uh, first thing I had to do was to go to the internet and educate myself on some of the marvelous things that the foundation uh, is doing. And one of the things I learned is what you've just seen in the video, that the foundation's been very active in creating a network of diagnostic laboratories focusing, as far as I understand it, exclusively on infectious diseases. That piqued my interest because one of the things that has been my dream for many years is to see a network of laboratories around the world that would have the capacity for assessing nutritional status and giving us the opportunity to create more rational intervention programs to control undernutrition under and nutritional deficiency diseases in particular. And so that motivated me to say, this is a group I need to get to know to try to benefit from some of your experience in creating and helping to uh, enhance the capacity of laboratories around the world. Um, it's something that needs to be done for nutrition and maybe I could even be so bold as to suggest that the foundation should expand its mandate and think about um, addressing some of these issues around nutritional diagnostics as well. The second reason for my puzzlement was that I was asked to speak on childhood nutrition in underdeveloped or uh, I think was expressed as low middle income countries and industrialized societies and to address issues around obesity, allergy, nutrition and psychology, <laughs> and I think several other items about which I have very little knowledge. <laughs> and so my response letter was to say that I would be very interested in, in getting to know more about the foundation and participating in the conference, but I really can't address those topics which are beyond my expertise. And uh, what I would like to do, given this theme of laboratory diagnostics, is to address the issue of the need for better data for uh, establishing more coherent nutrition programs, and my focus is, I would say, exclusively on low-income settings. So that's the perspective that I will take in my remarks, although I think some of these same uh, issues have relevance uh, anywhere in the world. The last point I want to make by way of introduction is just in the spirit of full disclosure, my employer is actually the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, we happily have a new infant at home, and I'm currently on family leave from the foundation, so I'm not able to travel on foundation business. So I'm here in my, um, my other role as emeritus professor at UC Davis. Um, and so if there's any confusion around that, I will be uh, talking about some of the activities that we sponsor at the Gates Foundation, but I will be doing it from my knowledge of that activity at UC Davis. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to start um, as probably not most appropriate person in the, uh, in, in the group to um, make these comments. Uh, Bob Black, who will be speaking with you tomorrow, who actually coordinated two now Lancet Nutrition Series that looked at the problem of childhood undernutrition and more recently overnutrition uh, in lower income settings and concluded in the latest Lancet series that in the year 2011, seven million children died before reaching five years of age. And of those deaths, an estimated 45% 
or 3.1 million were attributable to undernutrition. And as shown in the map on the right, most of these deaths are occurring in low-income settings in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. Now, we speak of undernutrition as if it's a single entity, but in fact, when you look at the causes of nutrition attributable deaths that were identified, these range anywhere from fetal growth restriction, which indicates a problem of maternal nutrition or health during pregnancy, to stunting underweight and wasting, which are acquired postnatally, in part in response to undernutrition in utero, in part to uh, inadequate nutrition and uh, uh, excessive exposure to infectious agents postnatally. Uh, several specific micronutrient, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, such as vitamin A and zinc deficiency highlighted in this table, and suboptimal infant feeding practices. So when we speak of undernutrition and nutrition-related mortality, there are multiple different conditions that we're referring to. And I emphasize that point because I, I think it's, it's much more obvious when we talk about infectious diseases. We talk about specific infections like malaria or tuberculosis or HIV. But nutrition, the global community and policymakers often think of nutrition as a single entity and tend to uh, s oversimplify what needs to be done. And so I'm going to keep coming back to that point. Because some of these conditions are overlapping, you can't just sum all of these individual uh, conditions and, and uh, the joint effects of all these nutritional disorders uh, is what allows us to arrive at this conclusion of the 45% of nutrition attributable deaths. Now, the Lancet series also specifically focused on individual vitamin and mineral deficiencies, as I mentioned. Uh, in the left-hand column on this slide, uh, you see the summary data. I didn't mean to do that. There we go. For the number of deaths attributable to each of these micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin A deficiency in children, zinc deficiency in children, iron deficiency in women, resulting in small for gestational age births and excess mortality among those SGA infants, and folate deficiency in women, resulting in neural tube defects and related child mortality. Now, I've debated this over several years now with Bob, and, and I've come to the conclusion that this actually represents an underestimate of the micronutrient attributable deaths for a, a number of reasons. The vitamin A estimate, for example, doesn't include vitamin A deaths in infants less than six months of age, which we know to be a factor if the mothers of these infants are vitamin A deficient. And in fact, studies show that you can reduce infant mortality among under six-month-olds by 13% among infants of vitamin A deficient mothers. The estimates of the effect of zinc deficiency don't include consideration of the, the effect of uh, maternal zinc deficiency and its contribution to preterm birth. And so when you add the um, impact of zinc deficiency on prematurity and deaths related to prematurity, there is another chunk of infant mortality that is likely attributable to undernutrition. Uh, in my own analyses, I estimated a greater number of NTD, neural tube defect-related deaths due to folate deficiency. And in fact, I think this has been borne out by a new committee that has met over the past couple of years under the auspices of the Micronutrient Forum. And I'll show you some data uh, from a, a, a this committee report in a moment. In any case, um, the actual number is still uncertain in large degree because we have so little information on the prevalence of these micronutrient deficiencies, um, but also consideration of the impact of these deficiencies on mortality risk. Whichever number 
we accept, and it may be even higher than these for reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll indicate, the number is unacceptably high and we need to do something about it. And to do something about it is going to require better knowledge of the true prevalence of these deficiencies, where they occur, and who is at greatest risk of having um, these diseases. Now, I mentioned uh, this uh, uh, committee report on uh, maternal folate deficiency and infant NTD risk, and I wanted to highlight this paper by Hannah Blenko that just came out in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, in which she has updated uh, the estimates of NTD-affected birth outcomes and concludes that annually there are 260,000 NTD-affected births uh, resulting in some elective terminations of pregnancy where, where fetal screening is available, an estimated nearly 60,000 stillbirths and 140,000 affected live births, about three quarters of whom will die in low income settings because of the lack of access to services. The same committee summarized existing information on the relationship between maternal folate status and NTD risk and showed that when the NTD risk is greater than about six per 10,000 live births, there is a progressive association with maternal folate status, which is to say that all of the um, NTD affected birth outcomes that are greater than six per thousand are likely attributable to maternal folate deficiency. In other words, two thirds of these NTD deaths could be uh, avoided with maternal folic acid supplementation. That number calculates back to about the 80,000 to 100,000 preventable deaths uh, that I alluded to on the previous slide. One other deficiency that uh, uh, has had some increasing recognition over the past few years uh, is thiamine deficiency, which continues to be a problem, a known and, and um, uh, readily observable problem in Southeast Asia and possibly in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. This example from Myanmar, uh, where there was a national survey of thiamine status using the erythrocyte transkelase activity coefficient, found that um, nearly 6% of pregnant and lactating women had evidence of thiamine deficiency. And surveillance in selected hospitals in Myanmar found that um, um, Infantile beriberi accounted for 7% of infant deaths, the fifth leading cause of infant mortality in that setting. So I think the, the estimate that, that was provided in the Lancet series probably represents the low end of the level of concern that we should be um, experiencing with regard to micronutrient deficiencies. There's one other point I wanted to make uh, on the basis of the Lancet Nutrition Series, and this is the fact that when you look at the estimated deaths and nutrition attributable deaths from the first to the second Lancet Series, you see that the total number of under five deaths went down substantially over that seven year period. The attributable, attributable deaths also decreased, but the percent of nutrition attributable deaths actually went up. And the reason is that the infection-related deaths are, are going down more rapidly than the nutrition-related deaths. So I think it's instructive to try to think about why that might be occurring. And I think the most obvious explanation is the resources dedicated to control of these conditions. But there are other explanations as well. I think the infectious disease community has much better global coordination um, in terms of decision making about uh, which actions to implement, which uh, interventions to deploy. They're much more effective in resource mobilization. 
Uh, and they're able to do this in large part because they have better data. So I'm going to come back to this theme of the importance of generating good data on nutrition status in order to motivate more and better programs. Now, just going through these points quickly, uh, this is a summary of development assistant disbursements over the 10-year period, 11-year period from 2004 to 2015, showing that the percent of overseas development assistance spent on nutrition has varied from 2% up to now seeming to stabilize at around 4%. This little bump we would like to believe was in response to the um, the play that nutrition got through the Lancet Nutrition Series, but it seems to have leveled off at 4% at the same time that we see that, that uh, nutrition is responsible for more than a third, nearly a half of child mortality. So nutrition is clearly under-resourced. Coming back to this issue of how we think about nutrition versus how we think about infectious diseases, uh, if you look at the, the way WHO organizes itself to address infections, there are special sections dealing just with HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, polio, neglected tropical diseases, food safety and zoonoses, immunization preventable diseases, and there's some activities on infection control through the maternal newborn child health section. Nutrition has two dedicated sections one uh, focusing on nutrition for health and development, and there's another section on prevention of non-communicable diseases, which in part focuses on some aspects of nutrition. And there's some nutrition work, particularly around infant feeding under MNCH. So there's just much more activity around individual infections than there are around these individual nutrition conditions that I mentioned earlier. Same is true at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where we have whatever that amounts to, eight, nine different um, um, program strategy teams and related resources focusing on individual classes of infectious diseases and one team of similar size to each of those focusing on nutrition. Now, I mentioned uh, the fact that the, the infectious disease community is much better coordinated. I just highlight two groups, the, um, the Rollback Malaria Partnership of multiple international agencies, uh, which is working to achieve consensus, coordinate action, mobilize resources. Similarly, under UN AIDS, there are a number of different uh, groups that uh, meet for purposes of advocacy, monitoring of the status of the infection, and again, resource mobilization. We don't have the same kind of coordinated effort in the nutrition community, something that I think is needed. Moving to data. Uh, these are maps published a couple of years ago that I, I found just gorgeous in, <laughs> in, in the way the data are presented. But these are maps with five square kilometer resolution looking at malaria prevalence at two different points in time. It's amazing to me, as a nutritionist, one, that the data are available to generate these maps. And then the things that you can do with this information once you, once you have it, it's not just having a pretty map saying where malaria is occurring, but these maps were then overlaid, or vice versa. Uh, intervention coverage was overlaid on the prevalence of the infection. And so you can see how much of the decline from 2000 to 2015 was attributable to which component of the intervention packages that were deployed over this period. And you can see, for example, that most of um, the decline can be explained by uh, uh, insecticide-treated uh, impregnated bed nets. And smaller but important parts of the decline are also attributable to artemisin combination therapy and residual insecticide spray. But having the data now allows you to go back to individual 
not necessarily communities, but individual health districts, and say what can be done here in terms of intervention coverage to address uh, uh, the need for more rapid decline in malaria. Well, until recently, we just haven't had the ability to do anything like this in nutrition. I am happy to say that just two weeks ago, the same team that produced these malaria maps has now issued a set of maps on uh, stunting, wasting, and overweight uh, for sub-Saharan Africa. They're currently working on the maps for Asia. But anthropometric data is the one thing that we do have in fairly large quantity in most of the developing world. And so we are, allowed, uh, we are able now to develop these same high resolution maps over time to look at the changes in nutritional status and how well we are meeting our um, sustainable development goals. Now these have not yet gotten to the point that the malaria maps have that we can try to look at these changes in relation to intervention coverage and use them to help planning the deployment of these interventions but we can use them to at least alert district level health authorities on uh, the current nutritional situation and rates of change and whether they are on track or not to meet global goals for improving nutritional status. Now, although we have this information for anthropometry, I can't claim that the information is necessarily easy to come by or always completely accurate. There are problems that have been identified with so-called manual anthropometry. The portability of the length board is a notorious issue. Uh, personnel training and standardization <clears throat> is difficult. And the accuracy and precision of the measurements are not always what they should be. For example, uh, a publication by the US uh, Agency for International Development just a couple of years ago looked at all of the uh, DHS, the Demographic Health Surveillance Surveys, conducted over the period from 2005-2014, and we're examining issues of data quality of anthropometry. And in the graph on the right, what you see here is plotted for each of the surveys the standard deviation of the z-score of height for age in this case. Now, a z-score should have a standard deviation of 1. And when you look at z-scores anywhere in the world that have been generated by highly standardized research teams, those standard deviations of z-scores are usually about 1, anywhere from 0.9 to maybe 1.1, 1.2. When you look at the DHS surveys, which is our reference information, you can see that more than half of them have standard deviations greater than 1.5. What that says is that the precision of the measurements is just not that good. And what that means is that the distributions are wider than they probably really are, and our estimate of the prevalence of, in this case, stunting, is higher than it truly is. So in some cases, although we have the information, we can't fully trust the information because the methods we're using are not optimal or not optimally applied. Now, recognizing this situation, um, a number of groups are now trying to develop <clears throat> imaging methods to replace manual anthropometry with the hope that this might become uh, more accurate and more precise and logistically simpler. Uh, we've been working with a uh, private company called Body Surface Translations, which has developed a very simple method using off-the-shelf hardware an iPad or an iPhone and a, uh, an infrared spray camera which takes three-dimensional images. What this company has done, which is what's really novel about their method, is that they take this three-dimensional image and apply it to, again, readily available animators software so that they can superimpose the image on the software, and then they can use that to manipulate the image. So they can digitally position the infant. You don't have to worry about, is the infant straight anymore? You can do that digitally. Uh, um, you don't have to carry around heavy equipment. You can carry an iPhone and, and 
grab your anthropometry. Once you have that dim digital image, you can then take cuts through any part of the body and get a head circumference, an arm circumference, a height, any body proportion that you choose. You could get body volume, and from body volume and known body weight, you can get body density and then get body composition. There are, there are lots of amazing things that you can do with anthropometric imaging. So we're really excited about this. Um, the first validation exercises are, are under the publication process right now, and I've been given permission by the group at Emory University, led by Ray Martorell and Joel Conkle, who have done a validation of 400 and some children less than five years of age. And here I'm just showing the technical error of measurement of the manual anthropometry versus the scan, and they're all within a millimeter of each other. So basically you can get the same degree of precision as a highly trained research team using manual anthropometry. There are still some small, less than a half centimeter biases in either direction for arm circumference or, or length that are being worked through, but the expectation is that they'll be able to go to the field later this year for the first large scale field uh, assessments of the imaging method in the context of large-scale surveys. Uh, just for completeness, I, I note that similar, uh, similar, similarly similar <laughs> technical errors of measurement were found for both arm circumference and head circumference as well as body length. <clears throat> now, moving from anthropometry to micronutrient status assessment, the picture is just not nearly as um, optimistic. I'm showing here a publication from 2015, which is an updated um, re systematic review of vitamin A status globally. And uh, what I want to highlight here is not the condition with regard to the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency, but rather the number of surveys that were available to produce this assessment. The, the map on the right shows the number of surveys done over this 20 plus year period in individual countries. And what it shows is that over this period from 1990 to the time of the publication, there were 134 population representative data sources from 83 countries. 55 countries had no data at all. They knew nothing about vitamin A status in the country, although it's an important cause of child mortality, as we've seen previously. 54 countries had just one data source over this 20 plus year period. And almost all of these countries, if they had data, they had one prevalence figure nationally. They could not disaggregate the data for individual sections of the country which meant that they had no ability to target programs specifically within countries uh, to high-risk areas. So we're really handcuffed with regard what, to what we can do programmatically if we don't have that information. It gets worse. <laughs> the latest update on countries with representative data on zinc status published last year, 20 countries now have data on zinc status. Again, an important cause of child mortality we don't know what the prevalence of zinc deficiency is uh, globally. I mentioned this growing awareness of the issue around thiamine deficiency. I don't know if it's growing awareness. <laughs> it's always been there. It periodically gets attention. Two countries that we've been able to identify have information that's nationally representative on thiamine status. Critical causes of infant mortality. In 2014, the Global Nutrition Report concluded that there are many gaps in data on nutrition outcomes, programs, and resources for the four World Health Assembly indicators where rules exist to classify countries being on course to meet targets, only 60% of the 193 UN member countries have any data. So how do we know if we're making progress? <laughs> Some of the areas that were highlighted in terms of data gaps were uh, information on low birth weight, small first gestational age infants, access to food, dietary intake, 
micronutrient status and anemia, which I highlight because I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about this now. Uh, information on program coverage, program costs, and even where we have information, as I, I mentioned earlier, there are issues of data quality, the frequency with which the information is a, becomes available, and whether it can be disaggregated to subnational groups within the national population. So what can we do to get better information on micronutrient status? Well, there are multiple different kinds of information that can be brought to bear. First, what is known about food availability or individual dietary intake. Food availability is fairly easy to come by. Uh, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations produces every two years uh, national food balance sheets, which tell you for, I think, 96 different food commodities what the total availability is in the country in terms of local production, importation, minus any exportation or other losses. And you can easily link that food commodity data to food composition information and say how much of each nutrient is available in the food supply of the country. Now, until recently, not much has been done to use these food balance sheets for nutritional purposes. Um, it's easy to do, and I would argue that countries should be doing this routinely so that they can in highlight where there is a potential risk of inadequate nutrients in the food supply. Now, there, the data are not useful in indicating which individuals in the country may have inadequate intakes, and it is conceivable that the food supply of the country could still be, could be adequate, but many individuals still have inadequate intake. But in the situation where the food supply is inadequate, you know that some individuals in that population have to have insufficient intake. And so it's a good start point, not to tell you the prevalence of deficiency, but whether the country does or does not have a high risk of deficiency, which then might motivate more specific assessments. Dietary intake is useful because it can tell you what percent of the population actually has inadequate intake. And it can also be used to identify uh, either foods that might be produced in greater amounts to provide uh, nutrient gaps, or food vehicles that are routinely consumed that could potentially be fortified as a way of meeting those nutrient gaps. Dietary intake data, any of you who have worked with dietary data know how challenging they are to get accurate data. Uh, they're very cumbersome to analyze. Uh, we are doing work at the foundation now trying to automate dietary data collection, uh, both uh, using image-assisted uh, dietary recalls, but also using totally passive dietary intake assessments, using imaging and sensors uh, to try to collect dietary data. We're still a number of years away from having workable systems, but we're trying to move in that direction. Clinical examination is also possible as a way of, of assessing certain micronutrient deficiencies. For example, xerophthalmia from vitamin A deficiency or rickets from vitamin D or calcium deficiency. These are also difficult because in, in some cases the clinical signs are not truly pathognomonic of a given deficiency. And typically the prevalence of clinical deficiency is quite low, meaning that you need very large sample size to get a precise estimate of the prevalence of deficiency. And so it becomes rather costly enterprise. So that then leaves us with biochemical assessment, representative surveys of subsets of the population uh, using biomarkers of micronutrient status. This provides direct information on the micronutrient status of the population and can be used then directly for planning and targeting programs. These are also challenging. Um, they are costly. They have a certain degree of complexity because of the need to collect and, and properly process the biological specimens, analyze them in the laboratory. And there are some issues in, in some cultures about the acceptability of obtaining the, the specimens themselves. But I think it's probably our best uh, option in terms of getting good data on 
population micronutrient status. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time focusing on what we can do to get better data on micronutrient status. This is just to highlight what I had said before about using food balance sheets. Uh, these are some analyses that we did in selected countries as a way to help guide the agricultural development process. Uh, in Bangladesh, for example, we found that uh, the food supply only provided 25% of the population's theoretical requirements for vitamin A, and less than 1% of the population was estimated to have vitamin A intake based on what was available in the food supply. And you can see across the board, the food supply is inadequate for many nutrients in Bangladesh. In Cameroon, the, the picture was not quite as uh, dire, but there was still a substantial proportion of the population with inadequate, uh, estimated inadequate intake based on what was available in the food supply uh, of vitamin A and zinc, which is mirrored, in fact, by biomarkers of A and zinc status in that population. So I would argue that information on the nutrient content of the food supply can be used to prompt decisions on agricultural policy, food importation, the need for large-scale food fortification, and can be used to motivate more specific assessment of the population status using biochemical or other assessment methods. The food balance sheet method has been used to uh, estimate the risk of zinc deficiency across countries, as shown in, in this slide, and has also been linked with the prevalence of stunting to try to have two different ways of triangulating the risk of zinc deficiency. Again, not to estimate the prevalence of deficiency, but to say whether zinc deficiency is likely to be a problem and more specific assessment of zinc status would be advisable. Now, if biochemical assessment is the preferred way to go, as I'm trying to argue here, what then are the obstacles to getting better information on biomarkers of population micronutrient status? Well, I think far and away the highest is the perceived high cost of data collection. There's also some um, controversy over which assessment methods to use and how best to interpret them in terms of which biomarkers to apply for which nutrients. There are a number of logistical challenges in specimen collection, processing, and transport. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lack of laboratory capacity and trained personnel to conduct these analyses. Well, what a nice challenge for the Fundacion Melia. <laughs> this is what I lifted from your website before I had access to your video. <laughs> and that is the importance of increasing access to diagnosis. And these are some of the things that you do, developing infrastructure, strengthening skills and processes, building laboratory networks, improving lab management and efficiency. All these things need to be done for nutrition. Now. With regard to these challenges, this issue of achieving consensus, um, the Gates Foundation has been supporting a group at the uh, National Institutes of Health in the US uh, for several years uh, called BOND, or Biomarkers of Nutrition for Development. Um, they formed expert committees to try to come up with consensus recommendations on the best biomarkers to use for assessing status of these nutrients and also for assessing the presence of inflammation and how inflammation should be considered in interpreting the results of these other biomarker assays. Uh, four of the expert review committee uh, documents have now been published. The other two are either in press or under review. Uh, and a series of papers on how to interpret the effects of inflammation have also been published. So I, I think now there's growing consensus on which biomarkers to apply for assessing micronutrient status for these nutrients. And over the past year, uh, two committees have been meeting under the um, New York Academy of Sciences to address the issues of assessment of thiamine and vitamin D status to add to this uh, growing number of biomarkers of interest. 
these are the conclusions of the committees so far in terms of which biomarkers to apply for each of these nutrients. I'm not going to leave these here for you to worry about now, just to say that, that there is consensus uh, on which of these biomarkers currently can be used um, for population assessment. Now, I mentioned uh, the, the challenges in the field for collecting specimens. Um, this is from the survey that I'm going to talk about in Cameroon in, in a moment, uh, in which we had our portable specimen processing laboratory slogging through the countryside because we are very interested in assessing zinc status and you need to separate the cells from the plasma fairly rapidly in order to have reliable information on plasma zinc concentration. So that meant we had to provide electricity and centrifuges to each field site for the national survey. We also had these improvised uh, hoods, basically plastic laundry baskets with a little bit of plastic wrap over the front so that we could do our pipetting and separation of plasma without concern of dust contamination. I should say that in, in uh, over a, uh, well, nearly a thousand specimens from women, a thousand specimens from children, we had only, uh, I believe it was three specimens total that were greater than the 97th percentile of the NHANES reference data set, which is to say there was virtually no specimen contamination despite these kinds of field conditions. So it is doable. That's another thing that you often hear. Well, we would love to have information on zinc status, but it's impossible to do in the field because of specimen contamination. Well, that's not true. Uh, you also need to be concerned about cold chain issues. Again, uh, uh, moving those specimens from the field to the laboratory can be done using portable fridges, freezers, liquid nitrogen tanks. It's all doable. It's difficult, but it's doable. Now, in trying to simplify this, we have been looking at alternative methods. So we've invested in looking at uh, use of dried blood spots as an alternative method of conveying uh, clinical specimens to the laboratory. And this is an interesting system developed by a company called VivBio, which has a pre-calibrated filter paper chad embedded in this platform and a, um, another filter that actually separates red cells from plasma in the same device. So basically you can drip blood onto this top filter, separate the blood, capture a known volume of plasma in the second piece of filter paper allow that to dry and ship it to the lab. And depending on the biomarker, some are, some are not uh, stable at ambient temperature. That's one of the things that we're investigating, which biomarkers can be um, uh, handled using this type of system. We've also been working with uh, uh, a company, um, Quansys, which has developed a multiplex ELISA system using a chemiluminescent assay uh, that, um, in which they spot individual wells of a 96-well plate with the antibody to each of those protein biomarkers that I mentioned. So the current assay has seven different biomarkers of iron, vitamin A, iodine, status and um, two markers of inflammation and they also have a malaria infection marker here in the bottom of a single well. So you can put one drop of plasma in the well and you can use this instrument which is also a really interesting development. It's simply it's a, it's a high quality camera in a box that has a fixed light source and takes a picture of the degree of luminescence of each of those spots in each well and the camera and the associated software then gives you a readout of your concentration for each of those spots. So the advantage is that with a single blood spot you can get information on all of those markers and we're currently working with them to do more validation and improvements of this system and to increase the number of markers 
Now, all these advancements are not going to solve all the problems. Um, when you look at all the biomarkers that I listed that are being recommended by these committees, there's a large number of them that can be analyzed by this type of multiplex ELISA system. But there are a large number of other biomarkers that require different types of instrumentation for analysis, whether it's HPLC or mass spectrometry, um, um, atomic absorption spectrometry for the minerals. The currently recommended assay for folate is a microbiological assay of red cells. So again, we're talking about some biomarkers are analyzed in plasma, some in red cells. So it still is a very complex system if you want information on all these individual uh, nutritional deficiency diseases. But again, something I think needs to be done. In addition to all these challenges, I, we need to develop this network of well-equipped resource laboratories. Now, I am not arguing that every country needs a, 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 a nutritional assessment laboratory. Indeed, if countries only do surveys at best every five years or so, a country couldn't support a national laboratory just for the purpose of supporting its surveys. So I think we're really thinking about regional resource laboratories which will require national buy-in and will require a respected regional organization to manage the facility. We need to have standardized consensus laboratory methods. We need to have more effort in training and continuous training uh, and quality control of laboratory personnel and, and uh, analytic systems. And we need certified reference material, which does not yet exist for a number of these biomarkers. Now, I'm going to finish just with a, um, a story from our work in Cameroon, uh, in which we did our best using what was available to us at the time. This was 2009, uh, in terms of biomarker data and dietary intake data to try to help the country develop what we believe might be a more coherent approach to control of specific micronutrient deficiencies. Now, why were we concerned? Well, because the consequences of data limitations are, one, failure to recognize problems that exist, <laughs> missing individuals within populations who are at risk, or providing them with insufficient amounts of nutrients to address their deficiencies, and on the other side of the coin, unnecessary or redundant coverage of interventions for people who don't need them or who don't need so many of them, as is the case for certain nutrition intervention programs. And this, of course, engenders unnecessary costs and a risk of excessive intake of some nutrients. So rather than firing off blind, as seems to occur for many public health nutrition programs, what we need is better data. And here I, I noticed that this quote was also in the, in the video earlier from uh, the, the president of the foundation. Um, Without diagnostics, med medicine is blind. I've inserted the words here, public health programs are blind. Same issue. Now in Cameroon, um, I'm going to provide an example of how we use this information to try to design more efficient uh, control programs for vitamin A deficiency. Now, in 2007, I was working as an advisor to Helen Keller International in, in West Africa, and we became aware that Cameroon wanted to implement a large-scale food fortification program, and the plan was to fortify edible oils with vitamin A, and to fortify wheat flour with iron, zinc, folic acid, and vitamin B12. And when we learned of this, uh, we said, well, we'd like to work with you and do a baseline assessment. One, to make sure that the selection of vehicles is appropriate, to get a better handle on the level of fortification that would be appropriate for this population, and to have a baseline so that we could assess the impact of the fortification program. And the country agreed that this would be a useful thing to do and worked with us to develop um, financial support to conduct a nationally representative survey, actually representative to three strata, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, 
which included the metropolitan areas of uh, Douala and Yaoundé, uh, the northern um, province, which we call the far north macro region, uh, which is a uh, dry um, savanna-like environment, and the rest of the country, which is a more humid um, rainforest type climate, um, which has a different food system for the most part than, than what is seen in the north. And what we have done with the nutritional status information that I'm going to show you is to say, how can we use that information along with what we know about actual or potential coverage of different intervention programs and the cost of delivering those programs to the target populations? How can we develop the most efficient intervention or mix of interventions to successfully address the vitamin A problem? Now, that's an issue because there's so many options with vitamin A, and, and countries are going about this willy-nilly um, without a great deal of thought about uh, how much or which of these interventions to deploy. So high-potency vitamin A capsules, that's been the mainstay of vitamin A control programs for a number of years. They, they were always viewed as temporary fixes until the food supply could be addressed. But in fact, they've gone on and on because we haven't successfully addressed the food supply in many cases. So these are high-dose capsules given twice annually. Dietary diversification, of course, is the goal. Food fortification is another approach. These are examples in West Africa of fortified oil or fortified bouillon cube. Uh, Low-dose supplementation, for example, through uh, micronutrient powders or lipid-based nutrient supplements, another option. Delivery platform for these are difficult, although uh, this is a role where the private sector could potentially step in and, and, and fill part of this gap. Biofortification, a growing uh, approach for um, either um, through selective breeding or agronomic approaches, or in some cases genetic modification, altering the amount of a nutrient in a staple food so that the population has access to more of that nutrient through their usual consumption patterns. And of course, breastfeeding promotion goes without saying, uh, important intervention for support of vitamin A status. When the mother is well nourished and when the mother is not well nourished, then we need to figure out how to support her nutritional adequacy so that she can support her breastfeeding. Okay, so how do we go about hitting the target? Uh, the example from Cameroon that I'm showing um, included a national survey using retinal binding protein as the biomarker of vitamin A status along with markers of inflammation to adjust um, the interpretation of the retinal binding protein. We also collected data on dietary intake, and shown here in the right, which I'll speak about in a moment, is some cost information. Now, what we learned is that the problem of vitamin A deficiency was greatest in the northern macro region, and that was shown both by the prevalence of low retinal binding protein and the prevalence of low vitamin A intake. Um, we also learned from the dietary data that the, the, the program that had been proposed and actually implemented by this time uh, by the government was not well conceived because the vitamin A fortification program of edible oil didn't, it wasn't a good match for what the actual consumption patterns were. It turns out that vitamin A is not that much of a problem in the southern part of the country because the population consumes red palm oil high in beta carotene. They don't consume fortified oil, but it doesn't matter. The cities consume fortified oil, which is mostly um, bleached palm oil or soybean oil. It's marketed commercially. Um, they don't have as big a vitamin A problem to begin with, but easily controllable through the oil fortification program. But in the north, where the program is the greatest, only about half the population consumes industrially processed oil. Most are consuming locally produced peanut oil. And so the program was designed with all good intent, but it doesn't reach the highest risk group. 
So this, again, is one of the reasons why you need the data in order to make the programs more coherent. We also collected information on the cost of delivering each of these different interventions that I described earlier. In this case, we're showing the cost of delivering high-potency vitamin A capsules twice yearly through child health days. And interestingly, it's actually cheaper to deliver them in the north because there's greater population density and there's also lower transportation costs and so on. So in fact, the high-dose capsules still seem to be needed in the north because of the inadequate coverage of the fortification program, and it's also cost-effective or more cost-effective in the north. So what we did was to take all this information and develop optimization models to say, um, what does it currently cost to deliver these vitamin A programs, and what coverage is achievable? And we define coverage here in terms of adequate vitamin A intake. So effective coverage with moving uh, individuals in the population from inadequate intake to adequate intake. And what we learned is that over a 10-year period of simulation of business as usual, which is the current program of twice annual vitamin A supplements coupled with deworming and oil fortification of industrially produced oils, that over a 10-year period, it was possible to effectively cover, I'm sorry, 12, nearly 13 million children at a cost of $35 million. That's the cost of the distribution of the vitamin A supplements, the cost of setting up the fortification program and the continued uh, monitoring of that program. Now, using the optimization model, what we learned was that we should probably add fortification of bouillon cube to the fortification program because the reach is much greater than oil. It reaches everywhere in the country and regardless of socioeconomic status with a very small degree of variation of intake. Um, and there are only three producers in the country or three distributors in the country. So a relatively easy program to manage. So the recommendation is, not yet been adopted, is to implement fortification of bouillon cube nationally, to implement biofortification of maize. This would be advantageous mainly in the north where more maize is consumed. And the interesting thing is that this approach would allow us then to discontinue vitamin A supplementation. Initially, we would only need to continue it in the south and the north. We would not need to deliver vitamin A supplements in the city because they could be effectively covered by the fortification programs. And by year three, when the cube fortification was um, actually rolled out, we would no longer need um, vitamin A supplementation in the south. So beginning year three and beyond, the program would consist of fortification of oil, bouillon cubes, maize biofortification at a certain estimated level of coverage, and uh, now high-dose vitamin A supplements needed only in the north. Now, the way the model is set up, we program the model to, so that we will cover effectively the same number of children at the lowest possible cost, and that's what the model solves for. And what you see now is that we're covering the same 13 million children over this 10-year period. That's what the model does. But the cost of these programs is now $19 million as opposed to $35 million. I, I belabor this point because the, the pushback I always get when I talk about the need for better data is, well, it costs too much. We can't afford that. We're a poor country. Well, we can afford to throw money away on unnecessary programs as opposed to paying a small amount of money for data. So, in fact, this analysis suggests a 10-year cost savings of $16 million. The cost of the data acquisition and the subsequent analysis and modeling and so on was less than a $1 million. Seems like a bargain. So this is what you can do with data. 
I'm going to finish there, let you mull over this, let the folks at the foundation think about all the opportunities out there. <laughs> the takeaway messages are that nutrition attributable child mortality remains high in low and middle income countries and represents an increasing proportion of childhood deaths. There are multiple different nutrition related diseases that, you need, that need unique forms of intervention. Lessons from infectious disease control programs should be applied for nutrition. Namely, we need better data and more focused interventions on these specific nutrition conditions. To improve the quantity and quality of data on population nutritional status, novel methods are being developed for anthropometry, dietary, and biochemical assessment. We need to continue working. This is, this is a long-term goal to try to simplify these data collection techniques, but we're making progress in a number of areas. There is, I believe, growing consensus on the best biomarkers for assessing population micronutrient status, and there are efforts underway to resolve some of the logistical challenges in collecting and processing and transporting and ultimately analyzing these clinical specimens. And ultimately, I believe that our interventions can be more coherent and more cost effective if we make these investments in better data. So that is my plea for the future. I'll stop there and thank you for your time.